Hello, good morning everyone. Greetings from London. Um, so first of all, thanks for joining this taster lecture. We start in a bit. Um, I'm just waiting for more participants to, to join. Um, just a few words about what we do. So I'll give a quick presentation of around 20 minutes, I would say, and, and then we have a question and answer session. So after the presentation, just type in your questions in the chat and I'll be able to answer them. Just checking how many we are. So uh, more and more people are joining. So I hope everyone can hear me. Maybe you can just um, text in the chat if, if you can hear, if everything is working fine. Okay, thanks for that and well, I think then it's time to start now. Okay, what I will not talk about today is I will not give an overview of what chemical engineering is. What I will do is I will give you some examples, some showcases of what research is in chemical engineering. And to be more precise, I'll give you some examples of what I did in my past and what I'm currently doing here in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Um, as you would have seen from the previous taste lectures, the disciplines of chemical engineering are very diverse. You might have heard from about batteries, nature-inspired engineering, nanotechnology. And since for me, my, my past and current research, that the common ground has always been particles, um, I would like to talk to you today about particle technology in chemical engineering. So, in a second, light and moving. Okay, who am I? Um, I am at UCL since three years now. Um, before that, I was working in industry as well. I worked for Siemens and the Research Center for Pharmaceutical Engineering. I was involved in sensor solutions. I did a lot of computer simulations and quite a bit of pharmaceutical engineering as well. Um, I'm not a classical chemical engineer since I studied physics and I then became a chemical engineer during my PhD. Um, as you might hear, I am not British, I am Austrian, and actually I am from the hometown of Arnold Schwarzenegger, so apologies if my accent does remind you of someone. Um, so let's start, what is particle technology? It is the science and technology related to the handling and processing of particles and powders. So what is a particle? Um, a particle can be defined as a small localized object or entity to which, and that's the important bit, we can ascribe several physical or chemical properties. So let's start with an example. And this is the example of, of my favorite particle. Um, it, it's a football. In this case is this year's Premier League football, the, the Merlin. Um, we can ascribe properties to it. Let's give it, um, it has a weight of 450 gram, has a circumference, it needs to have a certain pressure. Um, if you want a price, I'd say it's rather expensive. And if you go on the website, you find many more details about this. Um, there's another particle, apparently very similar. If I'm not sure if you would remember, this is the football used for the World Cup in Brazil, the brazuca. And if we compare the obvious properties, it is very similar to the Maryland football. However, if you would ever had the pleasure to play with the latter, which was also called a goalkeeper's nightmare, it behaves very different. And um, if you want the key property there is, is the bounciness, like it, it's, it's much bouncier than the other one. So and I, I put this here as an example that the obvious properties are not always the best to describe the key functionality of a particle. But let, let's talk about something a bit more, more relevant to chemical engineering. Let's talk about solid oral dosage forms such as tablets. So there are particles as well. So let's ascribe them some properties. We can describe again a diameter, a tablet has a height, a weight, but um, very intuitively, what is more important for a tablet? It's the actual weight of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API. So this is the, the medication. This is what is supposed to, to make you feel better. And, and that's what you find also on the labels of, of tablets. Um, and if you have a look in your home pharmacy, like whatever examples you have there, the example I chose here is aspirin. 
you will see that there are there is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. In the case of aspirin, it's acetyl salicylic acid. But there are also many other components which are called inactive ingredients. And so, as you can see, a tablet is more complex than you would think about. And it's actually much more of a high tech project than you would imagine. So, having that said, let's, I say, let, let's crack one open and, and see what's inside. So, you would break a tablet apart and, and zoom in. What we would see is uh, our crystals of the active pharmaceutical ingredient but we would also see particles or crystals of the inactive ingredients. And this little picture actually shows you nicely in red, it is a distribution of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API, and in green, the inactive ingredient. And I'll, I'll explain in a minute how, how this image was recorded. But then let's keep on zooming in to, to the tablet. So if you have a closer look then at the crystal, so this is a micrograph of an aspirin crystal I took during my PhD. If you would zoom in even further, you would see that, that these crystals are, are made of um, building blocks like entities. And these entities are arranged in highly ordered microscopic structure. And what these entities are, are these molecules, in the case of aspirin, the molecules of acetyl salicylic acid. And you might know already what a molecule is. So a molecule is composed then of the atoms. And in this case, um, we have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And I think by now these things start looking familiar to you. You might have seen them, for example, on the, the covers of your textbooks. So I told you I'm going to tell you how, how this image was recorded. So stay a bit with me and think of, of the molecules. So every molecule has a different composition, different structure, how the atoms are arranged. And different groups, different combinations of oxygen, carbon, um, things like this are frequently referred to as functional groups and functional groups do vibrate and different molecules have different functional groups and therefore different vibrations. And when we can, we can detect, we can measure these vibrations by shining a laser on them and measuring the wavelength shift of the reflected laser light. And therefore, if we would shine a laser on every point of the tablet, we could analyze the reflected light, see which wavelengths are reflected, and therefore conclude which molecules are there. And, and this is in a nutshell explained how, how this picture on the left was recorded. If you want to have a closer look, um, look up Raman spectroscopy and to learn more about this topic. So back to the properties. We learned a bit more now about what actually is in a tablet. And you might think, okay, what are the real key properties? We might think of the particle size of the API crystal. Um, this is important for the dissolution kinetics. The smaller they are, the more faster things can dissolve. Um, very important for pharmaceuticals is the homogeneity. We want all our tablets to have the same composition. And also important is, is coatings, for example. Uh, many tablets have coatings either for taste masking or maybe more important um, if we need time controlled drug release. And that might bring us to the, the most important property, the dissolution profile, because the dissolution profile of a tablet or the API in this tablet is what is actually determining when and where our body does uptake the API. So keeping this in mind, um, especially the homogeneity, I just said every tablet needs to have the same concentration of the API. Um, and this is not as easy as it might sound. Think of yourself when you would bake a cake at home. So you make a cake, a chocolate cake, made with chocolate bits. And after you bake the cake, you would cut this cake in small slices. And every slice, or every piece you cut the cake into has the same volume of, of a tablet. And then you compare all these little pieces you just cut out. What is the concentration of, of chocolate in there? And by by this, you would see many pieces would have no chocolate and many pieces would have a lot of chocolate. And this is absolutely fine if you bake a cake, but this is obviously absolutely not acceptable if you're producing pharmaceuticals that we want every tablet to have the same concentration of the medication. And therefore powder blending is actually uh, one example of pharmaceutical engineering where a lot of science goes into way more than you would think about. So what I'm showing here 
is a video. Bear with me. Yeah, and what you see in this video uh, is a blender, it's a particle blender. And actually you see here 400,000 particles in this computer simulation. And it does, it does help us to understand how long do we have to mix a powder or these, these powder mixtures and do we actually in the end get the homogeneity we want. Um, a few other examples of what I did during my PhD. Um, for example, I was working on a continuous process to encapsulate ibuprofen. Um, why is that necessary? For example, if we do not want the ibuprofen to dissolve in our stomach, but we want to have it dissolve in our intestine where it, it's more, where it's actually working. So you need to coat the microcrystals. And we did this with a kind of a cellulose coating. You would see it here and the micro micrograph with the little arrows. So this is actually kind of an encapsulation growing on top of the crystals. And what you see on the right is, is a dissolution profile. This is the key property I mentioned just before that tells you how fast the, the drug is dissolved over time. So by having this coating on that, we were able to, to retard this dissolution profile quite a while. That's, and that's what, what we wanted in this case. Um, another example, which does sound trivial, but it's actually way more complex if you actually have to do it, is to feed very small quantities of powder. Um, let's talk about feed rates of like way below one gram per minute. So these are very, very small, small amounts. And um, feeders we develop where, for example, what, what you see on the left, um, a powder pump, or on the right, um, that's what we call a vibratory sieve shoot sieve, uh, system. Basically a sieve, you vibrate it, powder is exiting, and that is then fed to, the, to whatever process we're feeding into. Um, so the latter is actually very, very similar to what you would have played in a sand pit with. And um, last application here, that's always, always my favorite, I always love working in this field. Um, it's the engineering of crystals. And the, the example I'm showing here is we used a flow reactor, a flow chemistry approach that allowed us to have crystals in solution and rapidly cool them and heat them again. And, and running these temperature oscillations, um, like several oscillations in, in like one minute, and that allowed us to very quickly recrystallize and dissolve the particles. And if you see, for example, the, the pictures in, in the middle, um, the picture A, I'm not sure if you see my cursor, you would have a lot of fine crystals, but also larger crystals. But these fine crystals, the small crystals, this is what is making problems, for example, in filtration processes, which usually follow uh, crystallization process. And most of the time, we do want nice big particles. And what we showed with this flow chemistry approach, we're actually able to transform the mixture of small particles into very nice bigger particles you, you see here under image D, um, which can be nicely processed and filtered. Um, but let's leave the world of pharmaceutical engineering for a while. Um, and let's, let's talk about something else. Um, if I would ask you what this is, you would probably not tell me that these are 80 nanometer gold nanoparticles. So, you might have heard in school already how much meter a nanometer is, um, but let, let's put it a bit more into perspective. So one of these 80 nanometer gold particles is actually three million times smaller than the football we saw in the first slide. And this just puts into perspective like what kind of different scales we're dealing with. Um, and what you also see, you might ask yourself, okay, if these are gold particles, why are they black? And the reason they are black here is we cannot use a normal microscope to, to visualize them. Why is that? Well, I'm not going into details, but a quick explanation hopefully helps you to understand is that the wavelength of, of light, for example, green light, which is the wavelength our eyes are most sensitive to, um, is 550 nanometer. This is much larger than the actual dimension of the particles. So you can imagine that this is not possible to see something small with something that is much bigger than the particle. So although you might have heard in school already that we can have electron waves, which are much shorter wavelengths. 
And that is what is doing the trick. However, we only have black and white because we only have electrons passing through the particles or electrons not passing through the particles. So what you see in black and white on the next slides, um, these pictures are always recorded with a transmission electron microscope. So I told you gold nanoparticles, we cannot see them with our eye. Obviously, they're much smaller than the actual wavelength of light, but they do appear and they do have colors. Um, this is again, example of gold nanoparticles, and they do change colors with their size. If they're small, like 10 nanometers, they are reddish, even pink, and they start becoming purple or blue when they grow or when they, when they agglomerate or they have different geometries. And you would think, where would I have seen them? I'm pretty sure you would have seen gold nanoparticles. For example, in something like this, um, this is a lateral flow test. And you might have seen them um, also recently in, in the media. I think uh, the UK bought quite a few coronavirus tests, which didn't work that well. But these kind of devices are lateral flow tests. Um, again, I'm not going into details, but I think it might be interesting to have a quick understanding how these tests work. So we do have the, the sample dropped at one end of a strip, strip a paper strip, which are in these lateral flow tests. And the sample does contain the analyte. The analyte then gets into contact with the gold nanoparticles. The gold nanoparticles with the sample or the analyte are then moving, are transported over this paper strip and they're accumulated um, in this example at two spots. At one spot, all the gold nanoparticles are accumulated. And at another spot, only those gold nanoparticles are accumulated that have been in contact with the analyte, i.e. the substance you want to see. So if they accumulate on both, you would have a, a positive test. Um, the reason why gold nanoparticles are usually used for these tests is that gold chemistry is, is a bit simpler and it's actually easier possible to, to bind things such as antibodies and, and these molecules we need to bridge the particle with whatever analyte we have to, to the gold nanoparticle. So that's why gold nanoparticles are kind of famous for these applications. So I've given you one example of um, nanoparticles and an industrial application of nanoparticles. And whenever you think of industrial applications, we need large quantities. And I already mentioned before how important it is for all these applications that particles, properties remain constant. So we have to think of ways how to reproducibly produce nanoparticles. We need reliable productions of nanoparticles. And this is what I was working on at UCL now since more than three years. Um, I joined the Mafuma project. Um, I put the link here if you wanna look up a few more details. And the goal of the Mafuma project is to find new manufacturing routes for the reliable production of healthcare related nanoparticles. So this does involve the development of flow chemistry approaches for large scale production, and also to identify the key process parameters for the reliable production of nanoparticles. Um, let me give you one example. So the video you're seeing here is the synthesis of silver nanoparticles. So what you have dropping from the top is a solution containing silver nitrate. And once this solution is dropped, it gets in contact with another solution that um, has a very reactive component. And this reactive component is separating the silver from the nitrate and allows the silver to form nanoparticles on its own. And since silver nanoparticles are yellow, um, the solution becomes more and more yellow over time. So as you can see, sometimes the actual thin synthesis for, to make nanoparticles is very, very easy. However, the devil is always in the detail. And what we find out in this example, for example, is that actually the mixing condition has a significant impact on the particle size. So if I would do the experiment, you would do it, someone else would do it, we would probably get three different results. So we identify that we all need to make sure we have the same mixing properties to have the same particle size over and over again. Um, since two years or a bit more, um, I started, I'm working now on magnetic nanoparticles. So the, I, I guess the most famous applications 
Um, I think they are in fashion since, since two decades now. There's a lot of research going on. Um, for magnetic nanoparticles is hypothermia cancer treatment and um, for contrast agents for MRI. Um, let me explain the first one a bit. What is hypothermia cancer treatment? So the idea is that you inject your magnetic nanoparticles in your body and we can localize them somewhere in the body where we have a tumor. We can then put the, our entire body into an AC magnetic field and the AC, an alternating magnetic field, would penetrate through the body. So it would reach also the nanoparticles and the magnetic nanoparticles, if they have the right properties, they would start heating up when exposed to an AC magnetic field. And since cancer cells are a bit more vulnerable to heat than healthy tissue, um, we, there is, it is a very effective measure to, to kill cancer cells. And therefore it's a, it's a cancer therapy. So again, we do need particles of the right properties and to make particles of the right properties, we need to understand the process. What you see on the left is again, a very, very simple, simple synthesis. So this is a synthesis to make magnetic nanoparticles. Again, we just mix two components. And as you can see here, things are happening very fast. So it is not easy to analyze what is actually happening in the first seconds or minutes. Um, if you think, how would we analyze these nanoparticles? Um, well, I said they're magnetic. And if they're magnetic, they are crystalline. All magnetic material has some kind of ordered structure and is therefore crystalline. And how can we analyze crystalline material? You might remember from, from your textbooks in high school that I think you would, would have learned it as, as the Bra Bragg law or the Bragg angle, that if we shine X-rays onto a powder or a crystal, the intensities depend on the angle at which it's reflected. So if you would screen the intensity, the angle dependent intensity, we would get kind of a, a fingerprint which helps us to identify the actual crystal structure. But the problem we had here is it's a very fast reaction and these methods usually take, take hours. So our reaction happens much faster than, than the actual analysis, analysis method is. So what could we do? And what we did is we traveled, uh, in this case, to Italy, close to Trieste, they have something called um, a synchrotron. And a synchrotron is actually a massive parcel accelerator. And these things do not only accelerate particles, they also provide you with highly intensive X-rays. And if you have such intensive X-rays, you can actually analyze the crystal structure, not within hours, but within seconds or minutes. And, and that's what we did here. And, and what we saw is that the magnetic particles we want are actually formed after four to five minutes. And that in the first minute, some kind of intermediate phase is formed, which is then transfer, transformed into the magnetic particles. And we were actually able to, to provide a particle formation mechanism of these magnetic particles. And we actually are very excited about this, this type of research. So, Coming to the end, I'm, I'm showing you how, how it currently looks in the lab where I'm working. So this is a picture of how my fume cupboard currently looks, or to be honest, I hope it still looks like this. Um, and this is a flow reactor for a high temperature synthesis. So again, we're making magnetic nanoparticles, but in this case, not with water-based methods, we use other methods, and they require very, very high temperatures, like 300 degrees Celsius and more. And particles we make, again, what you see on the right here are electron microscopy images. And so these are particles we make. And, and, and the question is, okay, because we're targeting magnetic hypothermia applications, like do these particles actually heat up in a magnetic field? And, and what we saw, the smaller particles do not heat up very nicely, but once we make them bigger, and bigger I mean here obviously on the nanoparticle scale, um, is that they start heating better and better. And what we recently found out is that if we actually have certain clustered particles, like we don't have a single particle, we have a specific arrangement of clustered separate particles, they are actually very excellent heaters. And we are very excited about this, these kind of results we're having and we're looking forward to, to apply them hopefully at one point. And the last thing for me to do now is to, to thank you for your attention. Thanks for joining. 
And, and I hope I was able to give you a little bit of an idea of what research in chemical engineering can be, or at least what it would look for me. And if I fail to do so, please feel free to, to ask me your questions now. Give me a second. I'm just trying to answer the, the chat, okay. So I have one question here. How do you make sure that all the nanomaterials injected into our body are fully secreted? And do nanomaterials have any side effect on human body? Um, this is the key issue. Um, this is a very good question. Um, the honest answer is, this is why it takes so long till you make particles in the lab and you actually have an application in, in the human body. Um, some people refer to it as the valley of death, which actually means what you, what you ask is, is perfectly right and perfectly spot on. Just if you have particles, you're still not even halfway through. There are a lot of things to do, a lot of um, cytotoxicity studies you need to see are these particles toxic in, in normal cells in vitro. And if results are promising, you might go to animal studies. If results are promising, you go to human studies. And only if all of these things look positive, you might be able to, to progress. Um, and this is why it usually also takes very long to develop things like, like a vaccine. But um, more on this, I think. Just, just read it up um, about clinical trials there. That should help. Um, another question I'm reading. What is the futuristic scope of particle technology? Um, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> particle technology, I mean, think a bit of, of the, the football, the tablet, and, and the nanoparticle. Um, particle technology is like I chose this today to talk about, but as you can see, the fields are very different. Like I talked a bit about pharmaceutical engineering, where you're more of, of microsc microscopic dimensions, and also talked about nanoparticle engineering, where you're on, on the nanoscale. And, and these are two very, very different dimensions to operate on. And so the applications are also very different. Um, and you might not be aware, like for example, how many nanoparticles are in our, our daily life products. Every PlayStation has quantum dot laser. Um, there are many more new TVs which actually work on nanoparticles. Much more nanoparticles are making their way due to medications. Um, there are a lot of things happening on both sides, not only the nanoscale, but also the microscale. So there is definitely a lot of things to do also in the future. I hope that that answers the question. Um, the next question I'm reading what are the benefits of studying chemical engineering? Um, that's a tricky one for me because I did not study chemical engineering, but <laughs> I did a PhD here and I can tell you chemical engineering is, is a very exciting discipline. Why that? Um, I hope you saw it from what I showed you today. Um, it's a very broad discipline. You can do many, many things. Um, I showed you some computer simulations. I, I didn't show much of this today, but I was very much involved in computer simulations and also a lot of lab work. It's the nice thing about chemical engineering is it's, it's so interdisciplinary and it's actually tackling real world problems. So that is why I, in the end, made the switch to chemical engineering because it, it has a lot of beauty in being in such a diverse interdisciplinary field and still tackling real world problems with experts of many fields and it's to put it mildly, chemical engineering is just a very fantastic playground and you will find the toy you like the most. So I think that's really the benefit of chemical engineering that you stay very, very flexible and then very, very broad and you can then specify to whatever you would like. I hope that answers that question. Um, was it more rewarding uh, working in industry? Um, this is a generic question again, like it depends on who you ask. I, I did enjoy both. Um, keep in mind that um, for most of the, the, the work I showed today, there was still industrial relevance. So 
if you do chemical engineering research, it does not mean you're not in contact with industry. Actually, it's the opposite. If you do research in chemical engineering, you're very much in contact with industry. So I, I don't really see these things perfectly separated. I don't want to call it academia, industry. You will always have both. Of course, certain things are different, and I can only say I, I did enjoy both. But in the end, I'm, I'm very much loving what I'm doing right now, and I'm very happy at UCL. Another question. Do the industry hire chemical engineers for research development? Or would chemists be more common in the big farmers? Um, well, find it out. Have a look yourself. Go on the recruitment site. But I can tell you they do hire a lot, a lot of engineers. And especially in, in the UK, um, pharma engineering there's a lot of actual production and manufacturing still going on in, in pharmaceuticals. So especially I think in the UK, it's a very unique spot to, to study chemical engineering if you're interested in working in pharma in the end. So there is definitely a high demand of chemists, but there is for sure, and I can tell you this, a high demand of, of, of chemical engineers. So, and there's definitely a high demand for big pharma for chemical engineers, I can promise that. Uh, next question, can you explain further on the test kits you talked about? How does capture antibody and anti-detection antibody work? Um, let me be careful on this. I'm, I'm not a full expert on this, therefore I'm, I'm not feeling very confident to answer this question. But I think the key things, um, the actual detection is by eye. And this is a bit the drawback because you might have heard that these tests are not sensitive enough. And why they're not sensitive enough? Maybe there was not enough antigen. Maybe there was not enough material that the gold nanoparticles could bind to and they would then accumulate. So that could be one reason. Um, and then you might end up with a pink line and you're like, okay, it should be red, but is it pinks? Is it positive? Is it negative? It's somewhere in between. There are much more um, futuristic approaches. And I think in the next month, we will see many more, a bit more advanced tests coming out. But um, this is where I stop commenting about it. Um, I think there are people which, are, should, which would feel more confident giving you here and, and, and detailed answer. Um, next question is, what is the process to identify the right material or in the case magnetic element required for your application, what properties would you consider? Um, I assume you're talking here about um, the magnetic hypothermia cancer treatment. Well, um, for this, it, it's, it's not too challenging. You want two things. You want a material of which you know it's biocompatible and you want a material of what you know it's magnetic and can provide high heating rates when exposed to an AC magnetic field. And the material which fulfills both is iron oxide, um, especially magnetite or magamide, which are two phases, two different crystal structures of iron and iron oxide. So for this application, simply because there's a lot of research that already went into iron oxide nanoparticles, I think those are the most promising candidates. And this is also where, where we, we are working with. Um, the next question, what do you think is the future of molecular engineering? <laughs> um, let me give you a similar answer that I gave before. This is not, not very related to my field of research, therefore I do not feel very confident giving an answer of this. Um, but I think it's, it's obvious that there is a future. Um, So again, I'll stick to, I will not comment on this since I'm not a biologist, therefore I cannot comment on, on molecular engineering. How do plants um, that produce pharmaceuticals make sure that the properties are constant? Something related to the design of the process? Um, this is a very good question. Um, and it is a big, big, I don't want to call it problem, it, it's a it, if for companies producing uh, pharmaceuticals, um, regulations are their daily bread. So 
which is also why it usually takes some time if you have a medication that you actually run and have the final product. Um, I'm giving you some, some numbers. Um, obviously, they're very much dependent on the actual medication. But from actually having developed a formulation and you went through all the clinical trials, um, it still takes a few years to actually get a product on the market. And the reason for this is because each process, starting from crystallization, ending up to actually pressing the tablet or filling something into a capsule, is very strongly regulated. So there are the regular bodies. You might have heard about the FDA in the States, which, which control every single process. And there's a lot of documentation going on. And this is why, especially big pharma, does need a lot of chemical engineering and they need a lot of process engineers to get these things right, not only for the documentation, but to have high quality processes, which are not prone to any fluctuation, because that, that's everyone's nightmare in the manufacturing of, of pharmaceuticals. If you have a process, you have it regulated, you have the permission to produce something with this process, and then for whatever reason, it, it stopped working the way it, it should work, because that means you have to do everything again, you have to regulate it again, and, and that is, causes massive delay and a massive loss of money, therefore, um, we need a lot of chemical engineers to design these processes. Um, I'm reading the next question. What are your advices for undergrad offer holders? Well, my advice is very obvious. I, I, can, I can only tell that, that UCL is, is a fantastic place. I've been, I haven't shown this, but I've, I've worked in the States, I've worked in Ireland, I've worked in Austria, and I've worked in, in, in several places. And UCL is, is very unique. Um, I can now speak from, from a researcher point of view, but the actual facilities we have are, are absolutely fantastic, and which is why I, I really love doing research here. And me as a researcher, again, it's also nice for me to work with master students and, and, and and undergraduate students when, when we come to the lab, because we do actually have amazing facilities. Like it, it's very, very fruitful and very, I very much enjoy working with undergraduates because here I have the possibility to let you work on actual real world problems. We, we can do um, things we did where like, um, we did gold nanoparticle synthesis with undergraduates as well. Um, we have, when you do nanoparticle research, for example, we, we need a lot of, I'd say very expensive, very complicated analysis methods. And UCL is actually very well equipped with these things. And I think especially for chemical engineering, there, there are a lot of branches you can go to. So I, I think if you have the chance to, to join that team, um, you should definitely take it. Um, are there many people who studied in natural science, chemistry or physics in undergraduate? and chose to do chemical engineering later. Um, yes, um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I cannot provide you with any numbers. So that's why the only answer I give you here is yes, I cannot provide you with, I don't know the statistics, how many percentage do that. But that is the beauty of chemical engineering that whatever you study, you do find your field and everyone is good at something, and especially good at something. And if you work in, in a chemical engineering department, you would have people of all the disciplines. And, and for me, it's, it's very good that I also work close with more classical process engineers and, and more classical chemists. And whenever I run out of ideas or run into a problem, there's someone I can consult. So just from the people I'm working with in, in, in the department, I can tell you there is a lot of interdisciplinarity going on. So again, I would just say yes. Um, Next question. There's a lot of talk about nanoscale. About, so what about scales below nano or pico scale? <laughs> well, I'm not saying nano is the end, but, but there is an end. Um, as, as you, if you look up the word atom, um, as if maybe in your textbook, it, it's, it started with the expression, Atom comes from an old Greek word meaning you cannot split it. Um, by now we know this is not true. Um, there is a lot of fancy things going on at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, for example. Um, so there are things below nano. There are things in the 
angstrom scale, which are the scale of actual molecule, um, actual atoms. And there are even things on the sub atom scale. Um, and we now, as humanity, since five years, we started exploring this. But so we can prove that things are there. I'm not quite sure how far we are or will ever be in actually making things at these scales. Um, so I don't want to say nano is, is the limit, but it will not go much smaller. <laughs> Hope that that answers the question a bit. Um, next, May the 4th be with you. Yeah, also for me, happy Star Wars Day. I'm very, very delighted to give it, give this little taste of lecture on, on that special day. I hope that answers this question. <laughs> um, how would you separate silver nanoparticles from the nitrate solution once the complex is pulled apart? That is an excellent question. And, and this is not easy because as, you, as I just said, you cannot actually see a nanoparticle. So how would you separate them? Um, and the nice thing that nanoparticles make stable solutions is Let's think bigger first. So if we have sand or quartz crystals or some, take something from the sand pit and put it in a glass of water, what will happen? It will sediment. Why? Because the sand grains are heavier than the water. Um, however, silver is also much heavier than water. So why are the silver nanoparticles not sedimenting? And, and the reason is because they are, they are that small. I'm not sure if you would have heard about Brownian motion, but just the energy we have, and in, at room temperature, in, in a glass of water, in whatever water solution, gives the molecules some, some kind of movement. So, and, and this movement has a little bit of energy, which you would not see on, on the micro scale, but if you go on the nanoscale, you see it. So these molecules, these water molecules, actually fluctuate all the time. And if the silver particles are that small in a nanoscale, they, they are part of this fluctuation and therefore do not sediment. In, in very simple words. So if we then would have to separate them, what we have to do, we would have to find a way to cluster and clamp all the silver nanoparticles together so that they form bigger particles, which would then sediment. And the way you do this is usually you, you change the polarity of the solvent. Um, for example, if you have something in water, we can just add ethanol or acetone. These things are soluble in water, but have a lower polarity. Um, and therefore, the, the silver nanoparticles, very much depending on what surface coating is there, feels less comfortable in the solvent and feels more comfortable with each other. So what will happen if you take a water solution with silver nanoparticles, you add ethanol or acetone, you, you shake it, you wait a minute, and you see smaller particles forming. You see microparticles forming, you can actually see, and they will then sediment. Then you just separate the supernatant and you let things dry. And, and this is how you would separate the silver nanoparticles. Um, next question. So I, I hope this is kind of answered the, I have to say very detailed question. Um, next question. What do you use? Um, why do you use AC instead of DC current? Um, first, I was talking current of fields is, is the same. Let's assume you have a constant magnetic field. Um, so the idea is, first of all, if you have a magnetic particle in a homogeneous magnetic field, it would not even move. Keep in mind that you can attract magnets with a field, but you can only attract magnets in an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Okay, so this is DC fields, especially inhomogeneous magnetic fields, um, are one thought people have to accumulate and, and target nanoparticles somewhere. Um, but what we want to do for hypothermia cancer treatment is we want the particles to generate heat. And if we, we just move the particles, and at one point they will, they will get stuck somewhere, those particles are not um, generating heat. So we need them to generate heat. And if we use an alternating magnetic field, so we change the direction of the magnetic field um, frequently, um, what will happen, either the particles will start rotating to follow the magnetic field, therefore they will generate friction with the surrounding, which heats up, or they just change the spin. They change the magnetization rapidly, and that also is, is a process that, that generates heat. 
So because we want either the particles to rotate or to change the, the direction of, of the magnetization um, to, to generate heat, um, that is why we, we're using AC instead of DC. Um, next question. What was the fact that you studied physics rather than chemical engineering an obstacle to doing your PhD in this field? Is there any advice you could give to someone who might be interested in changing disciplines throughout education, academic career? Um, so let me answer the question. Like for me, it was absolutely not an obstacle. Um, I very much enjoyed the switch. And of course, when you change disciplines, there are certain things you have to, to study, certain things you have to catch up. But on the other side, you also bring certain fields to it. Um, it, it was not, it was not hard for me to change field. It was also because I really loved doing chemical engineering. So it was, was actually very easy to, like whenever you do something you really love, doing it is, is, is never hard. And then because I really loved chemical engineering and, and then the many things you can do with it, I, I really enjoyed doing the switch. So it was everything but an obstacle to, to do a PhD in chemical engineering. Um, and I'd say what I just said might even be the, the advice I would give you. Like, don't be afraid um, and keep in mind that chemical engineering provides a lot of options. And I'm sure if you're interested in science, you will feel comfortable doing chemical engineering. Um, next question, is research in particle technology more focused on the process or the product? Um, this is too generic to give you a, a one answer, um, it is both. Um, it is definitely on the process, but it, again, it, it depends what we're talking. We're not talking about nano, about pharma engineering, about food processing, catalysis. There are so many other fields of chemical engineering that involve particles, which I haven't mentioned yet. Um, the answer is, is, is always both, but, and, and there are people focusing on, on one or, or the other. Um, I personally very much like the, the analysis and when you do nanoparticles, you, when you go on the nanoscale, it, it's a bit more, um, you have to study a bit more on the analysis, but, but otherwise for all the, the various fields I just mentioned, um, there is focus on both and there are people working exclusively on, on one of the others. So um, I'm sorry for not giving you a class, classic yes or no answer to this question, but I hope I at least addressed it a bit. Um, what are the current research topics in particle technology? <laughs> again, um, I think what I just said before, um, let, let me try again to come up with a list. There is, let's start small. There's a lot of nanotechnology research. Um, there's a lot of nanotechnology in, in medication, but there is probably um, more historically way more nanotechnology and nanoparticle technology going into electronics. Um, even standard products we use today, like the modern headphones, I mentioned the PlayStation before, and modern TVs, they have nanoparticles in there. So also on the small scale, there are way more products out there which have nanoparticles in there than, than you would imagine. Um, if we go bigger, I guess we have a lot of catalysis where we need high surface to volume ratio to have much interaction. Um, if you talk about solid catalysts, um, much interaction with the catalyst and the media. Um, we have um, food processing, the food industry. Um, there's a lot of particle engineering there. I, I mentioned pharma already. And um, if you go bigger, a lot of composite materials used in, in, in car manufacturing, airplane manufacturing, there is a lot, a lot of particle technology in, in there as well. And some field I spared completely was sensor technologies. Many sensors work on, on working principles that are particle related. So um, there are many topics. I'm, I'm sorry for not giving a very exclusive answer here, but it's, it's a very broad field. And I just cherry picked a few things I was active in. Um, next question, I did not study physics for A-levels. So what are the main topics you would be Sorry, the question is always moving. Um, I did not study physics for A levels. So, what are the main topics would be best to look into before starting a course? 
Um, I would never let high school demotivate me. Like I can tell you from my personal experience, it did take me some time to figure out that what I really enjoy the most is, is science. And I wasn't really putting much effort in, in school in science, but I, I do not let um, high school or whatever you do for your A-levels affect this choice too much because keep, put a bit into perspective how much time you spend in, in school on, on a subject. Um, in a year, you might have two hours, three hours, one hour per week. This would make it 5,200 hours a year. And then you think of studying something. So you might spend 100 hours in two weeks on something. So what I mean, in, you can probably cope with one year in, in school in two weeks in university. So I would always make this decision, let you drive by what you feel you like. Do not let you drive by what you think you know already, because the only thing I can guarantee is you have no idea what is out there for you to learn. So what you already know is, is just a small fraction of what, you, what is out there. So do not let this hold you back. Do what you feel love doing, and, and then it's, it's not a problem. Thanks for your time and lecture. Welcome. Um, do you think there's enough emphasis on particle technology? As you know, there are various other mainstream subjects we, which get most of the spotlight. Um, I, I partially, I'm, I'm not quite sure about this. I, I think that the reason is um, particle technology, again, is something I wanted to talk about. And it's usually not considered as, as a field on its own. But I hope you got the idea that particle technology is, is always part of other fields. Probably I could have called the talk um, healthcare related applications and pharma engineering, and you would not have thought about particle technology. But I called it particle technology and, and showed these applications. Um, so I would say particle technology is, is not underrepresented and gets the spotlight it deserves. Um, and it's, it's just part of, of, many, of many disciplines. Um, the next question, how does the AC not have any effect on the iron complex? Um, I'm not quite sure if I understand this question. Um, do you mean with iron complex some molecule which is formed, which people usually call an iron complex, um, for example, iron chlorides or where the iron is in the center of the molecular arrangement. Um, in this case, the particles, once the particles are formed, the iron is not in there in a complex form. Um, but if you mean with iron complex, the actual crystal, the iron oxide structure, um, the AC does have an effect on, on it. It's, um, it's heating. Oh, but if I understand the question, like if, if the particle properties are changing, um, then the answer is no, they, they wouldn't change with the field strength and frequency settings you would usually use. And it is definitely true, like you might have heard about the Curie temperature, if you heat these things up too high, um, they start losing the, magnetic, the, the magnetization or they behave very differently. Um, however, these are usually not temperatures we're really operating um, for at healthcare applications. So I think for the, the settings we usually using in terms of frequency and field strength and temperature, um, we would usually not expect the, the particle properties to change because of the field. Um, the next question, how is nanoparticle technology related to chemical engineering? Um, there are a lot of relations. Um, Again, I'm, I'm trying to give you some examples, maybe some examples I haven't shown today. There is a lot of nanotechnology and nanoparticle also relevant for, for batteries, fuel cells. You might've heard this in a, in a previous taste lecture. Um, to, to, and in my case, in order to synthesize these nanoparticles, there is, is a lot of reactor and, and process engineering involved. So, and also regarding the analysis, it's, it's not always that simple. You have particles and you have one kind of black box magic analyzer. 
is, is always um, a lot of processing and a lot of chemical engineering thinking required to, to deal and handle with nanoparticles. Um, again, just speaking from my, from my current activities, um, one example I showed today is like high temperature synthesis of, of magnetic nanoparticles. And if you think of a process that deals with maybe toxic chemicals, um, high pressures, high temperatures, and this all in, in a continuous process, um, it does get very complex from a chemical engineering point of view. So that might not answer the question you ask, but this answers the question you ask from, from my point of view. Um, there's a question, um, what are the master programs related to nanoparticle technology? Um, I think uh, the questions are getting a bit more detailed. I, I think for this, the best thing would be if you would just drop an email to UCL. Um, maybe Mark, could you type in an, an email address or some, some contacts um, to, to follow up on, on these kind of questions? Let me quickly type in my email address as well. So if you have any questions related to this or, or, or me or the research we're doing in general, just please feel free to, to drop an email to this address. So I hope you do see it in the chat window now. Um, so let me, I think we have a few minutes left. So let me see how many questions I can still answer. Again, if not, just drop me an email and I'll, I'll do my best to come back to you as soon as possible. Um, what kind of high school did you attend? Private state grammar. Um, what ability of math would you say is quite a successful undergraduate or postgraduate? Um, I would relate this a bit to what I said before. Um, I did a more language oriented school. So you might not hear this from my accent, but I actually studied more languages and the level of math I had when I started wasn't as good probably as, as those who did like more um, scientific schools. But again, keep in mind of what I said before, if you really like doing something, this, this shouldn't hold you back. And put into perspective again, the time you spend when you choose a topic and say, I study this, to the time you were able to dedicate it when doing high school. So do not be intimidated if you, you think your, your math skills are not there if you make this decision, you have way more, more time and, and, and energy to focus on this to, to probably um, cover some ground there. But, so it, it, it didn't affect me. I'm not saying you do not need math. No, you do have to study that, but I'm saying do not be intimidated. And I, I did everything but uh, a school which was very much focusing on mathematics and I, I felt very, I still very much enjoyed my studies. So do, do not, do not let this hold you back. If you think this is something you would like doing, then, then go for it. There is, if, if you like it, you'll have the energy to, to become the best mathematician you could think of. So keep that in mind. So I'll try to answer that, that last question. Has the cancer treatment been used field and what is the success rate of the treatment? Um, there are several clinical studies. Um, I, this is not a yes and no answer. And, and maybe just drop an email and we can have a bit more of a discussion related to this. Um, it, it very much depends on the type of cancer. There is a lot of activities going on for, for prostate cancer. As you know, this is a cancer um, many men suffer from, especially um, in the 60s and older. Um, there, is, there are a lot of um, studies right now how these hypothermic cancer treatments can, can cure that, that kind of cancer. Um, I, I do not feel confident right now giving you exact numbers and this is not um, an answer I can give you now in, in one minute. So um, there are treatments, yeah, it's not yet a standard treatment. So do not expect that someone diagnosed with cancer can just go to a hospital now and get such a hypothermia cancer treatment. But there are many clinical studies and it's, I'd say it's on the verge of becoming a standard technology if I have to make a guess now, I would say in five to 10 years from now. Okay. So I hope I was able to answer the questions. Again, maybe Mark, you can um, just quickly type in the email where students can 
contact you, me, or, or the relevant person if they have questions more related to the curriculum or which modules they can take. Okay. So, on that, once again, thank you very much for joining. And I put my email there. Um, feel free to contact me, and I'm, I would look forward to follow up on some of the discussions we had before with you. Okay, so may the 4th be with you. Have a happy Monday, a good start in the week. Bye.